Uh, today, session is getting right with technology flourishing in the age of anti-social media. We have our friend today, Luke uh, Rashkoff. Uh, Luke is a coach working to help people uh, live with more freedom, ease, and connection about what they care about most. Uh, he has um, experience in doing focusing, nonviolent communication, and applied rationality. Uh, and yeah, the session is about getting right with technology. And Luke is uh, launching uh, um, something, a project related to this, and I found it quite cool. So I invited Luke to the to STOA to share his thoughts. Um, so how today's gonna work is uh, Luke is going to um, um, share his screen, present his thoughts, and then we'll do a Q&A uh, at the, the second half. It will be about um, 60 minutes in total, but we might go a little bit uh, above the hour. So, yeah, and if you have any questions anytime, just throw them in the chat. And when it comes to the Q&A portion, I'll call on you. You can just ask your question to Luke. Uh, so that being said, Luke, welcome to the STOA. You're getting a round of applause, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, I first have to say, I don't know who LSA crew is, but I think you guys win the record for most people in one Zoom screen at one time. That is, that's incredible. <laughs> Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. As Peter said, this talk is, uh, yeah, getting right with technology, flourishing the age of anti-social media. Um, yeah, before we start, uh, it's like 95 degrees where I am, so I'm going to be sweating, and I am also nervous, but it's mostly just super hot, <laughs> just so no one sees me and thinks I'm having a heart attack or something. <laughs> um, Cool. Well, I'm really excited to be here with you guys talking about this stuff. Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and talking about it. Um, and I hope it's valuable for everyone. Before we jump into the content, um, well, let me see. Okay. So uh, we got a little Samuel L. Jackson meme. I really like this. I, don't know, I just really like his face on the right. Uh, if you spend a lot of time on Zoom, you know about this. So. Uh, I just found out about this, so this is why I mentioned it. When you are watching a presentation, you can watch just one person on the side if you want to watch just the speaker and just see me, or you can change the setting up top in the right um, and you know see the whole gallery if you want to see other people, and then you can adjust the size. So that's kind of cool if you want to tweak it to how you like it, and then that can make a difference. And Peter, some more people are joining. Is there any way that you can admit them while I'm presenting or? Yep, I got it. Okay, cool. All right, so um, just a little bit about, here's the agenda for today. I wanna to start with a little bit of spiritual orientation, just what the, what the vibe is here, what the intention is. And um, then we'll do a little focusing check-in to start. Then I'm gonna talk about the problem as I see it. And then I'll share some principles and practices that I've found useful for um, getting right with tech with a little bit of a chance to reflect on how to apply them in your life. And then we'll have some Q&A and discussion. So spiritual orientation. At a high level, the way I see what I, the vision I'm laying out is, um, also there's a lot of birds around here. So I'm sorry if that's distracting, but yeah, it's just a lot of birds. Um, so I see, what, I see what I'm doing is offering kind of the middle way between techno optimism on the one hand, technology is just great and all good and it'll kind of make everything better. Uh, and techno pessimism on the other hand, and techno pessimism is either like, we gotta become Luddites and destroy the machines in order to return to the primitive utopia or uh, it's just going to suck. Like it's worth the convenience of living with technology, but it's just going to suck. And we kind of have to accept that for the sort of fatalism. And I reject both of these. Um, and I think there's some truth in each of them, but I, I want to just sort of lay out this project as like the middle way between these two extremes. Um, I use the phrase getting right with technology and at the STOA, everyone who comes to the STOA is familiar with this, you know, getting into the right relationship with stuff. Um, but it can be kind of like, it can sound prescriptive, like, ah, I'm going to tell you how to get right. Like, I know, and you should just, you know, listen to how I say it. But I like to think of it as a process, like, not a set of, I don't know what it looks like for you to be in a place where you feel right with technology. Um, but I think there's a process that'll be helpful in 
getting you there. That's what you want to think about. And then right is just as you understand it, as you feel it and know it in kind of an embodied way. Like, again, there's not a checklist that says, oh, now you're right with technology. There's just this sense of like, cool, this, this is good with me. I feel like I'm right with this thing. So I, I intentionally kind of evoking the phrase like getting right with God or getting right with, you know, some kind of thing like that. Because I think it can feel like that. I'm like, yeah, this is right. And I just want to name, like, I feel like whenever I talk to people about technology, I have this sense that they kind of hear me saying, like, you shouldn't be using your phone so much and you should feel bad about using your phone. Um, and there's just a lot of, like, there's just a lot of that in conversations about technology, I think, on a low level. So I just want to dispel that. Uh, I hope nobody feels more shame as a result of this talk <laughs> or as a result of hearing me talk about this stuff because I think there's enough of that already and, and nobody needs any more of that. And the final thing is just a suggestion for how you might listen to this talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff and you might just, I want us to suggest that you listen with sort of what might this look like in my life? How might this be of value to me? So with that, I want to lead everyone through a very brief exercise of taking about two minutes. And um, this will be a focusing check-in. And uh, if you're not familiar with Eugene Gemmon's focusing, it's a cool kind of practice, sort of body-based. And I'm just going to put these prompts up on the screen. And then in a minute, I'll kind of guide us all through them. But the prompts are going to be this. What we're going to do is we're just going to say as if it's as if it's really true and we really believe it. Everything in my life related to technology is fine. Things are just perfect in the, in this area of my life. They're they're just exactly the way I'd like them to be, and I feel free and happy completely in relation to the digital world. And you know you can probably already get a sense like this is probably not true for everybody, but the point of the exercise is to, to really kind of say that as if it's true and just see what comes in response it can be a really helpful way of sort of surfacing things. So um, you can invite everybody to take a minute and you can kind of just settle in a little bit. Some people find it helpful to close their eyes while doing an exercise like this, but you can do them with your eyes closed. And just take a minute and kind of come into the room a little bit. And maybe feel into your body a little bit. Points of contact where you're resting on the chair or whatever you're sitting on. When you feel settled a little bit, you say out loud or just in your mind, as if you really believe it, everything in my life related to technology is fine. It's just perfect in this area of my life, exactly the way I'd like it to be. free and happy in relation to the digital world. And just notice what responds. In Maybe there's a kind of catch or a but, like, not that. Maybe there's multiple things, maybe there's nothing. Just seeing whatever comes. And then whenever you're ready, just coming back into the room here. Open your eyes if you had them closed. Come back in and out the group. Okay. 
So I'd love before moving on, um, Peter, I, I guess we didn't talk about this, but I'd love to just hear from anybody who feels like sharing about what came up, what that was like. Um, so is there any way to do raising hands or people just unmute themselves? What do you think, Peter? Yeah, popcorn style, just unmute themselves or raise your hand uh, icon wise and you can, Luke can call on you. I can't see the whole screen, but yeah, if you raise your hand digitally with a little button um, or you can just unmute yourself and share, but I'd love to hear if anybody has anything to share. Dave, is that you raising your hand? It is. Cool. Yeah, go for it. So the first thing that came up for me is that when technology fails, as it often does, any anxiety that I feel just passes through me very easily. Yeah. Cool. I think I understood. Meaning like you just sort of, you become less anxious when tech fails? Yeah, at age 74, I think I might be one of the older people here and technology is, you know, if if uh, I weren't so uh, happily blessed with equanimity, I would be cursed with lots of anxiety. So, and that's an ever, uh, um, you know, going forward journey. Uh, anxiety can bit, bite me at any time. So that's that's from an older user. <laughs> cool. Sharing that. Good. Yeah. I'd love to hear if anybody else had anything come that like was something sort of bothering them or something not quite right. It's like yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I think when I was repeating these phrases to myself, uh, I heard a voice in my side of my head that basically said, are you really though? Um, particularly with everything in my life related to technology is fine. Um, so more negative. Yeah. So something in you was like, eh, I'm not really sure. And did anything in particular sort of come yeah. from that? Yeah. Like here's, here's how it's not all good or just a I general think, sense. For me, um, when I was in college, I had a better relationship to it. Not that anything changed, but I think I had a more like integrated sense of my online life with my real life. And I've moved to a new city in the last two years and I'm feeling kind of like that doesn't exist anymore, so. Yeah. Yeah, cool. thanks for sharing. Yeah, Evan, you wanna go? Yeah, I guess, um, I don't know if this is a relevant share or not, but I thought it was maybe worth sharing that there's, I felt into a sense of irritation surrounding the questions themselves, that, that they, something about them seemed quite off to me, if that makes sense. I think so, yeah. Like they didn't seem true or, or something about the framing and the phrasing felt like not cool. Yeah, like, like that's it. The, the framing of the question seemed likely to mislead, I guess. That's the, like, like I, I do a lot of focusing and that's like, like, there's a thing that happens to me when I'm doing focusing where I'm, I feel like my body's telling me you're asking the wrong questions. And that's what I felt with doing focusing on these questions briefly. Okay, interesting. Cool. All right, yeah, maybe if there's one more, if it needs to go, otherwise we'll move on. I can share if no one else wants to. Yeah, yeah. Go for it, I, just, I just noticed on the third one, I feel free. I, I started to actually feel uh, trapped and like really anxious and like my heart started racing and my shoulders got really tense and I was like, oh no, I don't feel free. So that was actually the like physical and somatic experience that I had. Thanks for sharing. All right. Um, well, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, whatever that is, go ahead. Uh, sure, yeah. So um, 
the uh, the way most feel that technology is summed up in the Grandpa Simpson quote. Um, I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what it see and what's it? Sorry, seems weird and scary to me, and it'll happen to you too. Um, that's pretty much how I feel all the time when it comes to technology. It, so the question of everything in my life related to technology is fine. It's almost like, but I wouldn't even know. I don't know what I don't know. And that's the scary part. Everything is changing so quickly. And there, are, and it feels like there's more and more that in order to be a, a, a quote unquote with it citizen that we're expected to know. Um, and I don't even know what I don't know. Um, and that, and I don't even know how to know what I don't know or how to find out what I don't know or what I should know. Um, and um, it both, not just in terms of actually using the technology, although that's very real, but also in terms of, of online culture um, and the ways it affects offline culture to the extent that there is even is an offline culture anymore. Um, so yeah, that's what I had. Okay, yeah, cool, thanks for sharing. Yeah, all right, well, it seems like this didn't quite, from, from people sharing, didn't quite produce like, ah, here's this clear thing about technology that doesn't work for me. Um, so I guess I'll just say a little bit about for myself. I, I asked someone yesterday, how, how is your relationship to technology? And he said, I lo love hate. Um, and I kind of feel like that seems like it summarizes how it is for a lot of people. That's my sense. And that's what it has been like for me. So, okay, cool, I'm gonna move on. So uh, I wanna talk about what I see as the problem here. And yeah, I'm gonna break that into two parts. First part is it's not about the tech. Second part is it's about the tech. Um, I think these represent sort of two old or extreme perspectives on you know, issues with technology. The first, it's not about the tech. The extreme version is, you know, if you ever feel dissatisfied with technology or like you can't stop using it or you don't like the way it works, you know, that's really about you. That's some weakness of willpower or something. There's always been distractions and stuff. It's, it's, not, it's not about the tech. I think that's basically not true, but there's a kernel of truth in there. And then the other extreme is it's about the tech. Technology companies, people who make them are just the boogeyman for everything and all of our problems boil out of that. This is a different kind of beast. And I think, again, not, not true in the extreme, but there's a kernel there. So I'm, tr I'm trying for the synthesis here. I wanna start with, it's not about the tech and I'm just gonna go quickly and cover a lot uh, because I think this is kind of just familiar for most people here, but I, I want it to be sort of the background in which we do this stuff. You just have the human condition to start with. We all are just born into a world that contains impermanence, entropy, mortality is a fact of life. Like we're going to die, people we know are going to die. Things change all the time and that's difficult. We're social monkeys with verbal thoughts, which is different than being a social monkey without verbal thoughts. It has its own whole set of problems and difficulties. And then our environment is just going to fail to provide for us in all kinds of ways. You know, from when we're born in our family to when we go to school and they don't teach us the stuff we really need to know to survive and all, all the way up to culture and, and country and stuff. And in response to those conditions, we're going to have maladaptive responses, mal in parentheses, because they are kind of adaptive. Um, we're going to like grasp to things. We're going to cling to things. We're going to try to avoid suffering. We're going to try to resist things being the way they are. We're going to develop strategies, cognitive, emotional, behavioral strategies to cope with like the difficulties, the real difficulties of life. And they're gonna be helpful sometimes and then they're also gonna be inevitably limited because that's just how things are. And so I really like the Buddhist phrase here, which is like, life is just 10,000 joys and sorrows. And so here we are, this is like the conditions in which we live and technology didn't create these conditions. This is just what life is like. And if technology becomes perfect for us, this will still be what life's like. It's kind of just like this, you know, just sitting in a burning building, drinking your coffee. And that's just how it is. That's just the basic conditions of life for us. But from my perspective, it is also about the tech. 
I, I don't think that we're living in a time where it's just like business as usual or that it's really true to say there's always been distractions and like, you know, it's just a new version. People, people didn't really get addicted to newspapers. People didn't have a trouble, you know, uh, getting through their work because they were constantly, I don't know, maybe they did, but that's not my sense. It seems like something like meaningfully different is happening right now with the tools that surround us. And I think a good way to summarize this and summarize what's happening is um, a couple terms from some different authors I like, Cal Newport and Kim Wu, which is that there, we're, we're in a lopsided arms race between us, between each of us as individuals and the attention merchants. And there's a bunch of jargon in there. So I'm just gonna break it down, starting with attention merchants. Um, I'm not a scholar on this. Tim Blue is the guy to, to read if you're interested. But from what I understand and the way I think about it, you know, there are entities whose primary business is the sale of human attention to advertisers. That's the main way that they make money. Uh, you've got your classics, Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube. And in some sense, you can think about anyone who does anything as an intention, being an attention merchant, like the main currency, the main capital of human beings is attention and time. But it's, there's definitely a clear shift when there's a divergence between the person who uses a product or a service and the person who is paying for it. And so the, the, money, the money that like supports Facebook, Twitter, and Google, and YouTube doesn't come really from the consumer who uses them. It comes from a person who is paying for advertisement, paying for the opportunity to have advertisements, paying in, 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 in essence for the ability to use people's attention. And there's this great quote from this, um, I, I heard it in this documentary, Social Dilemma, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. This was not really like intuitive to me, but if you think about it, like there's gotta be some money coming from somewhere. It's not coming from me. It's coming from the people who want my time. So there's a free service and the audience is monetized. You know, I think this is maybe basic for everybody. I just like these little silly memes. There's Facebook eating. So moving on to this next part of this summary, the arms race, what makes it an arms race is that there's a fundamentally antagonistic dynamic between the user of a service who wants to control their own attention and the service itself, which also wants to control the user's attention. I don't know if it needs to be this way necessarily, but there is just, I think in practice, a dynamic where we want to control our attention and spend it the way that we want to. And from the perspective of a service who profits off of our attention, they also want to control it and to be able to maximize the time we spend on platforms and tools. So there's just a kind of incentive structure. No one needs to be evil. No one needs to wish ill upon anybody. There's just this fact that there is a kind of antagonism between I want to control my attention and have my own intentions you know, carried out and a tool that profits off of my attention wants to also be able to control it and sometimes intercept my intention. Um, I like this phrase, intercepting your intention, because I've had this experience a bunch and I, I imagine, I think it's pretty common. You like go to a phone or a computer or some tool and you have an intention like yesterday, it was to see like the niece and nephew's photos, like photos of the niece and nephew. And you go and then like maybe a few minutes in, you realize that either you're doing something completely different or you realize after you've like entered into this tool and then left that you didn't even do the thing that you came there to do. Um, maybe, you know, oh man, I, I like just looked at some photos from a year ago. That's what happened this time. And there's nothing like created about this phenomenon by tech. It's not like people didn't forget or lose track of their intentions before tech. You know, you walk into the kitchen and you're like, what am I even doing here? But there's like a, a frequency and an intensity with which this happens. When you go into have an interaction with a tool and you lose track of what you're there to do and you end up doing something else. And I think we kind of take this for granted like that, you know, I don't know, it's sort of normal, but imagine if you went to an ATM and like while you were going to the ATM to get out money, you started doing something completely different like reading a book through the ATM. And then you left the ATM and you didn't even get the money you would sort of be like, what, what kind of weird tool is this that like I frequently lose track of what I'm doing and don't even achieve my, my intended aim when I interact with it. So that 
to, to me is like an arms race dynamic. And finally, the lopsided piece is just that there's billions of dollars. There's like some of the top talent, technical and general in the world. You know, there's massive amounts of computing power, collecting data and running tests and just optimizing and repeating all, you know, trying to capture attention. And there's no ethical codes, lawyers, doctors, all these industries have ethical standards or some kind of regulation, but there's not, as far as I know, any in, in tech. So I think fundamentally there is something about the tech. And I think what, what we end up with is it, what uh, the Center for Humane Technology calls inhumane technology. And I think this is a really powerful concept. The definition is just technology that ignores or exploits human vulnerability. I think the key here is like, there are human vulnerabilities and inhumane technology, as I'm gonna talk about is, it's not necessarily this weird evil Machiavellian thing, like we're gonna screw over the people using it. Mere disregard for human vulnerability has negative effects. And I think it's fair to call that sort of inhumane. So um, with that definition in mind, what does that look like? I think that fire alarm red notification badges are an inhumane technology. Uh, I think there's a human vulnerability, which is when we see the color red, we think in some way or another. If you think about the things in our world that are red, it's fire, fire trucks, stop signs, uh, red lights, fire extinguishers, warning signs, danger signs. I, I can't really think of any things that are like that kind of red color that conjure up a sort of nervous system response of calm or soothing or relaxed or even just engaged or happy or, or any kind of reaction other than like tension and activation. So that's a human vulnerability. And whether or not it's intentional, I, I would bet it is intentional. But this technology interacts poorly with that human vulnerability, such that when you see a notification, you're going to go, uh, even if it's just your friend being like, hey, I'll be there at two. Another inhumane example of inhumane technology is this kind of general, but Cal Newport has this term I really like, the hyperactive hive mind. And this is, you know, on these different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, even email in a workplace, Slack, people talk about getting just like totally overwhelmed by the constant back and forth. And so the hyperactive hive mind is a bunch of people, all of whom are communicating in a hyperactive way, a lot of, a lot of like high bandwidth, a lot of communication happening asynchron asynchronously, so not at the same time. And I think the human vulnerability here is that we have like limits. We have limits on our social capacity. We know like Dunbar's number is 150. We know that re I know research on group size for collaboration generally converges on like four to 12 people is manageable and beyond that it gets a little bit much. And so we know that there are social limits to where, to where people can function well. And I don't think anybody decided, you know, here, let me engineer this situation where like everybody gets 30 emails a day or gets 20 Slack messages through their work or, you know, has this sense of like there's a couple hundred people whose relationships I'm monitoring as a social being. Um, and, and yet here we are and, and not attending to that is an example of inhumane technology. It just doesn't work well for people, which is not to say there are no benefits for um, this kind of communication. I think there definitely are. Uh, this is sort of another broad category, but a lot of the devices we use are operating with the same principles as slot machines. Um, there's a great podcast on the Center for Humane Technologies podcast um, with a, an expert on casino design. And, you know, we know that humans are vulnerable to a variable reward schedule. If we know that there's going to be a reward, but we don't know when exactly, we're just going to keep doing that thing. Animals do it, people do it. So that is a really powerful tool that hooks us. And that's what slot machines, that's how slot machines work. And that's how, you know, scrolling through a feed works too. It's a variable reward schedule. And it's probably not someone who's like, yeah, let's make up this variable reward schedule to keep them hooked. Maybe there is. But from casino, from the example of casinos, often it's just really brute force A, B testing, like which one gets people to use the thing more. We'll do that one. But what we end up with is this experience that's really frictionless where you know, all it takes is a, is a thumb movement and it's kind of infinite. There's no, there's no set end period. 
there are very few pauses and there's a variable reward schedule hooked up to social reward, which is also very powerful for Unity. So this is another example, I think, of inhumane technology in that it just doesn't attend or, and, and actively exploits the fact that people will just stay using this thing past when they kind of want to. And to use kind of a sad example from casinos, uh, at least one casino manager reported, described, you know, almost every night, a, a whole bank of machines, of slot machines is taken out into the alley behind their casino to be washed because people urinate on them. People go into casinos sometimes wearing adult diapers and they intend to be there just through whatever, you know, they need to take a bathroom break. And, you know, there's this powerful like hook that's just there. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this is another example of inhumane tech and really common. And a final one that's maybe less obvious is having multi-purpose tools with these kind of intention interceptions. I think humans are vulnerable to losing track of their intention. It's just something that is part of being a human being. You want attention. But having a multi-purpose tool like a computer or a phone where there's no option to just go into it and use it in one particular way is actually is both a benefit in that you can do all, all sorts of cool stuff and a risk in that you know you have to wade past a bunch of things in order to do what you want. An and or a surprising email, uh, example is email, where there's actually two functions in email. You can send and receive messages. And by default, you can't do one. You can't just send a message without going to look at all the messages. There are extensions that you can use to sort of hide your inbox, which I like and find valuable. But you have to do that yourself. The tool as given is, you know, here, whenever you want to send a message, you're going to have to like blind yourself to a bunch of things that might pull your attention away from what you're trying to do. And that just creates more stress and more effort and energy needed. So we're in this arms race. We're not alone, though. We're not unarmed. There's a bunch of resources we have. There's a lot of whistleblowers. This guy is a Raskin who invented the infinite scroll uh, and founded the Center for Humane Technology. There's lots of research on the effects of tech use. And there's lots of popular press stuff that I'm really drawing on here. Cal Newport, Tim Wu. Maybe you've seen this over on Insta. And the Center for Humane Technology has this beautiful vision that they're trying to bring about in the tech world on the producer side um, of humane technology, technology that you know attends to or even cares for human vulnerability, supports people in carrying out their intentions rather than intercepting and subverting them. You know, watches out for ways in which people are susceptible to get stuck in loops and gives them the opportunity to break out. Examples like, you know, what if when you were scrolling after a while? You know, it started to slow down or gray out, and you got a little, oop, okay, I've been stuck here for a while. There's a little bunch of examples like that that I think are really powerful and kind of realizing, make, making me realize at least, like, oh, it doesn't have to be this way. It could be different. So, um, my mission for today is to build on all that work by just making a little space for people to apply these resources and others and create some opportunity to, to connect and, and just have a little community with people who are also interested in this stuff. Uh, and this is my general project too, to support people in living well. It's really what I want is for people to live well and to do that through transforming their relationships with tech. Okay, so I wanna, I'm gonna go just through a couple of these um, since we don't have a ton of time. But here are some principles and practices I've found to be useful. This is like a mindset, not a technique or something, but um, this comes from Cal Newport and it's to be Amish and process. And what I mean by that is um, a little bit subtle. So the Amish are not Luddites. I used to think that the Amish didn't like technology or didn't use it, but in fact, they just really focus on their values and hold close to their values. And then they carefully and strategically use or ignore and eliminate technology as a means to living out their values. Their main value is community. They really care about having a strong community. So they ask the question, will this technology preserve and strengthen our community or will it weaken and undermine it? And this is a question that can be asked for any given value. If you really value you know, connection with nature, if you really value a kind of ease or a kind of engagement or a single focus, whatever your value, whatever the way that you wanna be living is, you know, there, there is an effect that tech will have on it. And so the Amish ask, 
you know, what will be the effect of this technology in my life on the way that I really want to live? And everything flows from there. So I think this is a sound process to follow, even if you don't want to end up as an Amish person <laughs> driving a horse and buggy <laughs> um, and, you know, staying off the grid. But it's cool to see they end up with these kind of strange scenarios where they're, you know, pulling a, pulling a motorized tractor by horses or, you know, riding a horse and buggy, but having a really advanced computer powered, you know, cutting machine for the work that they do. So I think this is a, just a great mindset to have to really like guide how we relate to tech is what, what do I care about? How do I want to be? And then will this tech support me in, in being that way or will it make it more difficult? So I'm actually just going to pause here for a sec before moving on. And um, yeah, leave a little space to just reflect on what it might look like for you to be Amish in process in, in your digital life. All right, the second practice that uh, I found really valuable for myself, I think is really powerful, is called a digital declutter. And the original concept comes from Cal Newport. And it's kind of like Marie Kondo's tidying up method, if you've heard of that, which I think is actually very profound. You, you know, connect with the vision of your life that you want. You get all your stuff out on the floor and then you do the thing where you hold it up and you ask, does it spark joy? And it sounds kind of simple, but it's, I've done it and it's pretty, it's pretty cool to really be like embodying the, the vision that you want and then have your physical stuff be filtered through that. And so digital declutter is basically the same thing. You take a 30 day period where you just completely eliminate optional technology use. And there's a lot of work being done by optional. You need to figure out what that is. Um, but um, yeah, you completely eliminate any optional technology use that won't, you know, it won't hinder you in, in significant ways to not use it. And during that time, you just use the space and time that was previously taken up by tech that you've eliminated to reconnect or connect for the first time with what really gives you life. So while I was doing a declutter, I went and did a bunch of walks in the woods and I read a bunch of books and I did puzzles and I baked bread uh, and I learned how to do spray paint art. And so there's all these things that like, feel like they bring me closer to who I want to be that uh, I just connected with during this month. And so um, you spend this time doing that. And then when you're done, you, you get a little bit of space. It's pretty profound, the shift that can happen when you just take time away from something. And from a little bit more space, you reintroduce and modify or ignore tech, however it looks like it's going to really support you in living the way that you value. So it might mean, you know, not going back to an app that you've spent a bunch of time scrolling on and don't miss. I got rid of my phone browser and I don't miss it. I just feel better not having the temptation all the time to look at it. But yeah, some things come back, some things don't come back, some things come back with, with limits. So yeah, I think this is a, a really powerful uh, practice to go through. Okay, I think this will be the last one before Q&A. And this is kind of a, another broad approach, which is to take control of your interactions with tech. I think there's a couple concrete ways to do this. One is to introduce friction. So a key feature of the tools that I think most of us have trouble with is that they're frictionless. They're super easy to get in and out of, they're super easy to access, they're super easy to keep interacting with. And a little bit of friction, it's not gonna come from the tool, but it can come from you. And that can look like, you know, really simple stuff like getting an alarm clock and putting your phone in the, in the room outside when you sleep so that you're, you have to get up and go get it in order to uh, scroll. Keeping a computer or a phone in a specific place so that there's a little bit of a barrier to use it. There's all sorts of tools and apps that some of which I've found useful, one in particular called Freedom that um, will, will block or delay sites that you visit. And uh, that's just a little bit of friction that can, um, yeah, that can create a little space. The second thing is to change your default to off. So a lot of these things that we use are like default on. 
it's just everything is default on unless you make it otherwise, basically. But you can change to default off, and that can be concrete, like setting up a little block on a website so that you know there's only a specific time during the day that you can use it. I do this with my email, um, or it can be a little bit more of a of a felt shift within yourself, like okay, I'm just gonna by default not be using my laptop which is like a profoundly different shift than okay, my laptop sort of the default thing. And then whenever I get off it, I get off it. And same with single purpose. I, I have the capability now, which I love to just send an email instead of sending an email and having to wade through an inbox too. And so this is a, a shift that can be pretty helpful. And the uh, last thing is to explore the space between stimulus and response which is when you've introduced a little friction, when you've created a little bit of space by changing your default to off, you get a little room from the moment when you feel the, the urge to use some kind of tool and the actual behavior. Uh, I had this experience yesterday where I was, a couple of days ago, where I was in a meeting or in a group event, and I kept like feeling the urge to Google the people that were in the events. They're sort of in my field, and I kept feeling like this urge to Google people. And... I didn't have any block or anything. I just have a practice where I want to have a little space between stimulus and response. And so I just asked, like, what is this for? What am I, what am I going to get from Googling these people? And it was to, to get some reassurance. It was to get some validation that, like, you know, oh, they're not that impressive or something. And so it's a really small thing, but, like, that kind of practice just creates more freedom, more agency, more ability to not be pulled anytime there's some kind of urge or, or impulse to use tool. And here's a stupid meme where, you know, here, if you can't read it, it's in your mind, you like command the phone and he says, yes, master. But in reality, the phone commands you and tells you what to do. First, and I asked what their relationship was like. He said, he said, love, hate. And then he was like, I asked him to elaborate. And he says, well, it feels like it works for me, but then I'm also kind of its slave. <laughs> And I feel like this kind of captures that. Uh, okay, so I have a couple more things, but I kind of want to stop now and just do some Q&A and dialogue. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Um, very cool. We, we got some um, good questions in the chat. Uh, so how, how about we stay 15 minutes, at least 15 minutes after the hour to get some, uh, uh, at least three, four questions in. Does that sound good, Luke? Cool. Yeah, it sounds good to me. Cool, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll ask a question because uh, this is quite a lie for me. Uh, this has sort of been my project for the last couple of weeks, getting a right relationship. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't say tech because we had this conversation before. It's like, I don't need to get in the right relationship with my lawnmower, for example, or like my vacuum cleaner. Um, it's a certain type of uh, uh, tech. And what I found really helpful for me was sort of like um, conceptually bounding what kind of tech was uh, the problem space. And to me, it was correspondence. Uh, it wasn't necessarily entertainment like YouTube or anything. It was a uh, correspondence type uh, social media or like text, really just normal text, email, and then social media like Twitter and then other stuff. Those are the ones that really pulled me. Um, and my intuition says that's sort of related to that Amish value of community. Like uh, most of us, you know, we, we have a verisimilitude of community or atomistic community, but we don't have that deep sense of community. So perhaps this, the correspondent tech is, is ones that we, we run to. Um, so I guess my question for you is, do you think it's helpful bounding uh, the, the space, like, okay, correspondence tech, entertainment tech, and then having kind of like, a, um, you know, a way to uh, deal with it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely helpful. Um, I think the bounding I've sort of come to or been trying to get gesture at here is like inhumane tech as one kind of scope. Uh, same, I don't feel like I need to, you know, be on my guard with my lawnmower, um, but any tool where like I know somebody's making money when I use it more, um, then I'm a little bit wary. So, yeah, I, I think there's lots of different ways to cut it up, and I think that's definitely valuable. Um, or even another way to bound it is sort of like, you know, what is like, what is the motivation or the value for me? What do I get out of using it the way I use it? Maybe some tech is sort of like self-soothing. Some of it's like procrastination. Some of it is approximating, like you said, community or connection. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of value in, in bounding and, and clustering. What is it exactly that you know is not working for you? And why? Cool. 
we have a, a lot of similar uh, questions. Um, we won't go in order, we might not get everyone, but I'll take in uh, Kevin next. Uh, feel free to ask a question, uh, it's most alive. Thanks, I had a couple questions, but um, since you were, this is actually not a question I asked, but something came up like when you were talking about as a communication method. And I, I used to use my, like, when I was living in a city, I, I was like, I'm gonna use my phone just to arrange meetings with people, <laughs> like real life, you know, rendezvous with people. But then COVID happened. And it's like, <laughs> I, my, like my smart, my smartphone techniques were not prepared to like, you know, have communications with people. Um, yeah, I wonder if you like come across any sort of like best practices. Cause it's like, if you're trying to communicate with someone you don't know, like sometimes they're there, sometimes they're doing something else, especially if it's like text based, like versus if we're in the stoa here, everyone's very present versus like, you know, if you're, yeah, having to, trying to have some asynchronous communication. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. So a couple, I mean, um, I, yeah. Tell me if this sort of lands or if this is on track, but what, one thing is, you know, the classic like batching or just containing. So uh, this is what I do now with my email. I have a time in the morning, that's email time. For a while it was a specific time, but I just know like I'm gonna do I'm going to check this, I'm going to check Facebook Messenger, whatever it is. Um, and, and I can just relax the rest of the time, knowing that like I'm going to get there and I'm going to take care of it. And then I'm going to be free. Another, another kind of cool um, practice that I also got from Calvin Ford is having office hours. So he's a professor and he has office hours, but he um, suggests, you know, in your just personal life, um, having a period where you know, where people know, and you know that you'll be reachable. So like 5, 6 p.m. every weekday or whatever. And I don't know, that's another thing that can be cool is to just create little opportunities for connecting people in a way that's like contained. Um, yeah, those are some, some thoughts. Any follow-up, Kevin? Um, no, that was a good answer. Um, I sort of had another simple question. Um, have you found any interesting practices or like research around like technology meditation? Like, cause I've noticed a noticeable, noticeable difference, like just my phone being on and like connected to Wi-Fi versus an airplane mode. Like, I think that's a degree of friction. I think, you know, introducing people to like some sort of smartphone mindfulness and like, like noticing that just even that little bit of friction can make a big deal can like be very helpful. Um, I wonder if that's anything you've come across. Yeah, I haven't come across anything other than just what I've come to myself. Um, I think most of the most of the solutions in the like tech space seem to be mostly focused on behaviors and like hacks and stuff that will set set things up in a way that works. But um, I I do think like just a really basic thing like do mindfulness practice with a digital tool, like open your email inbox and sit there for 15 minutes and see what it's like. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot that happens and you're probably gonna learn a bunch about yourself, about the tool, about your relationship, just sitting there and feeling like, oh my God, oh my God, whatever it is that comes, you know, Jesus, get in the way or, you know, the thoughts, the sensations and everything. Um, and yeah, I think I was doing a little bit of that in this little story I told about, you know, the temptation to Google people. And I just sit there and wait with it and bring awareness with acceptance to what's happening. So I think, yeah, I haven't found anything formal or like formalized, but I think there's a beautiful practice there, which is bring that kind of awareness to, uh, to using the tool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Evan, you had a, a few questions. Yeah, so I guess I'll ask, one of mine has a pretty decent follow-up to the line you guys were just talking about. So. <clears throat> um, I, I guess to set the frame for it, I, I find it quite interesting that there are all these psychotechnologies for developing a better relationship with your attention, your intention, your awareness, you know, these, these types of things that might be considered under the broad rubric of meditation practices. And these have existed for at least, you know, three, 4,000 years, probably much longer. And yet they've never really become mainstream in any real sense, in any society that I'm aware of. And so um, my question was originally like, do you think that there might be a sort of interesting forcing function um, happening here whereby actually getting some level of 
meditative practice and, and comfort with psychotechnology might actually be for the first time really necessary to survive and thrive in the world that we've created for ourselves. And then I guess I'll add on to follow up to Kevin's a second aspect of that question, which is, um, so for me, I see it as basically you should meditate enough that you can deal with technology, not you should try to use technology first, right? And so I wonder if you have any thought with respect to ordering or sequencing there. Yeah, yeah, cool. I love this. Dude, I always love your questions. Thanks, man. Um, I hadn't thought about like, I suppose that maybe is blessing in disguise. Like now you just can't get away if living in this world without practicing managing your attention. I do think that's kind of happening. Like, especially in our circle where most people, I think, I don't know about most, many people are knowledge workers. Like you don't spend your time in physical labor where you don't need to be super, you know, managing cognition and attention stuff. So yeah, maybe, maybe we're having like this cool blessing in disguise where it's just going to become kind of essential. Cal Newport has a cool book out called uh, A World Without Gmail. And it's about like, what does it look like to have workflow not centered in this crazy hyperactive hive mind? And he doesn't talk much about attention or contemplative practice or any kind of phenomenological practice, but um, I think it's right in there with like, what does it look like to have work that works for people who are doing knowledge work? Uh, I think probably it involves that. Um, and your second question was, what's the order? Yeah, I feel like there's a, there's a tricky, there is a tricky circularity there. Like you should meditate until you can use technology. Um, you know, it, it's tough if like you still have to use technology to get by. <laughs> um, and I think for me, there's this balance of like, yeah, again, it's about the tech. It's not about the tech. Like I want to be the kind of person who's able to handle anything that comes at me. Who can wield my attention and be like, cool, I'm, I'm losing track of my intention. Great. I got it in the face of even all this stuff. But like, but it is, it is different. It is a different level of thing. And so I don't know if your question was adjust technology to where you can handle it, or if you're, you're talking about the sequencing, I guess there's sort of a difference there, but I think there's a two, there's a two prong thing, which is like, how do I make this, how do I make this tool like more workable for me? How do I increase my capacity to interact with this tool in a way that works for me? And yeah, they go to they go together. Any follow up, Evan? Yeah, I mean, if it's okay, I'll just ask my second question. Cause yeah, I guess, I guess like, um, my other question somewhat related was I really like your, your um, zooming in on the Amish approach and how they're not Luddites. That's something I think a lot about. And the thing that always kind of strikes me about that is that they have community support for this practice. So I was then trying to connect that to this thing that's been in the zeitgeist around the stoosphere, at least of say like the dark forest theory of the internet, you know, right. Um, and this idea that the real meaningful social interactions that you might find on the internet are increasingly going to be in these sort of like hidden darker communities uh rather than in the, the clear net or what have you so i'm wondering do, do you think that that might be a way to sort of develop the community support we need to be you know techno neo amish or something like that right or or do you think it's possible for like a sort of atomized individual whose main social interactions through technology are just on the big clear net platforms like facebook and twitter yeah 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 another great question um yeah, I want to name the term dark forest too. I don't think I totally understand it, but it's like these little kind of closed off hubs that are not like anybody can get in, but you know, it's a little bit of a you know, an insular community where we've got doing our own thing. It's a little bit darker than the vast. And, and like not indexed, right? Not like anybody can just find it. Yeah, so a couple thoughts come. One is like, I think, I think you can really get down on yourself one can really get down on oneself by being like ah, I should be able to do this on my own like something that I have thought about a bunch is like when I asked the question when I was doing the declutter myself like what would I do without this tool or what would I do without this like you know just this service that like everyone's using and the question I responded with was like what did everyone else do for all of human history without this tool and I think that's a powerful question to ask because it frees you from like this reliance that's there suddenly at the same time, this is just a different time. Like people had support, they had church, they had tribe, they had whatever they had. Um, and so we're, we're just not in the same place. Um, and we do need, we do need all sorts, all like all the community we can get. We're mostly not Amish and we're far from it. So I think, I think totally relying on, you know, 
I think it's just, there's a lot of beautiful stuff to stow it here, right? Like relying on people who you connect with, who you share a purpose with through, yeah, small little intimate bonds across the virtual space is awesome. And my project, I'll say, I'll plug it at the end, but I want to have a, I have a group opportunity for people to go through the declutter and go through practicing this stuff in a, in a, yes, yeah, small group setting, which was super great for me. It, it was very hard. I struggled for many months when I had kind of like somebody asked in the chat, like, how did you know you want to focus on this? The way most people who do helping stuff focus on their thing, which is you run into a brick wall and you're like, how do I get over this? <laughs> and I spent months just struggling with bouncing from my inbox to Facebook to YouTube, running away from my life. And I tried to do stuff on my own. Eventually I came to like, okay, I need to make a technology addiction support group. I need to have people because with anything like addiction, which I think this is a, can be a behavioral addiction, you know, stuck on tech. Um, I think having communities is the way to go. So for sure. All right. Um, let's see if we can get a few more questions in. Uh, Jay, uh, was that a question that you just threw in the chat? Would you like to share your? Uh... Oh. Oh, uh, that was mainly just a comment, um, not so much a question, but thanks. Did you want to share it? Look uh, interesting. Uh, sure, sure. Um, let me pull it up here. Yeah, so I just, I, I was mainly just kind of tagging on to the conversation that um, Luke and Evan were having about like, does it make sense to um, start with meditative practice and then kind of bring that into engaging with technology. And I've found for myself that um, after kind of having gained some experience with like traditional Buddhist meditation, I can sometimes, not all the time, you have to be really careful with this, but I can like scroll through Facebook or YouTube or something like that and just meditate on, oh, there's a limbic hijack that's being attempted or there's, you know, super normal or hyper normal stim, stim, stimuli of various sorts. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but I would just maybe suggest that as something to explore once, once you've once you've got a baseline of meditative experience or, or experience with meditative practice. Yeah, yeah, I would second that. Yeah, what comes to mind is um, we used to do a lot of experimental stuff at the STOA and uh, remember that loving, um, what's it called? Uh, that celebrity uh, um, Imagine video when the COVID first came online, everyone started singing Imagine, it was so cringe. Um, so we did a loving cringe meditation where we watched it at the stoa and then we did like a loving kindness meditation and we felt the cringe in our body and then in that session we watched a lot of other like commercials and stuff it just felt like how we're pulled and kind of like you know like our like kind of hijacked in a way so it was like a uh, opportunity to see these cultural artifacts and then uh, meditate with them which is quite cool uh, so i imagine like a lot of psychotech could be uh, built around that yeah i want to jump in with one thing peter which is Sure. I think a great way to a great way to make that valuable is to is to do something like a declutter because I stopped watching TV, I stopped using Facebook, I did a you know I just disengaged from a bunch of stuff, and when I've come back to it, it's sort of like I feel like the veil is pulled back where all the stuff that just kind of floated right through me, but is really like watching a violent movie scene is a very crazy experience if you really pay attention to it. So is watching a TV commercial or a basketball game or looking at Facebook. <laughs> so there's an essay that I um, like called on continually questioning the digital experience or something like that. And I think, yeah, very valuable to get a break and then come back and, and see it fresh. So let's get maybe one or two more questions in. Um, Mia, I think you had a question. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about your suggestion to go Amish, and I think it's just hard to, to know what matters or to know what values to prioritize. Like, I was just reflecting on how um, I get a sense of connection and community and ease from using social media, 
Um, and there's a real loss when I cut those things out. And so it's hard to kind of know what to prioritize or what values matter most. So I was just curious if you've had any processes that you found helpful in figuring that out. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I have two thoughts. The first is, well, I guess three thoughts. One, yes, it's hard, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> This is a frustration I have with Cal Newport's book. He's sort of like, do the digital declutter, like do what you love. And I'm like, man, this is like a whole book you could write about how to figure out like what, what matters to you and what um, gives you life. So two thoughts. One is, I think that doing a contained like fast or declutter or detox, whatever you want to call it, where you know that you'll come back or can come back can really clarify what it is that you value about something. You said you feel like a loss when you cut that stuff out. So maybe you already do kind of know what it is. But um, yeah, I think when you when you remove it, you when you know that it's going to come back, you can maybe see a little more clearly like, ah, what I miss is this part. Um, but if that's not super clear, here's something I do. I just have a little running list of like moments of aliveness or something like that. And I have I've did it first from memory. And I thought of like, periods in my life and, and in specific moments too where like you know you know what that means probably where like you really feel alive and you really feel like this is it like this is what this is what's good this is what's right um and they're very like profound and poignant just to have like as a collection uh, and as a reminder and a sort of guide and i think you can also sort of gently mine them for what it is that matters like for me, there was this moment I had where I found a stick in the woods and it just felt like a great walking stick. And I was just like walking around with the stick, kind of playing with it. Uh, and, and I was like, man, that felt alive. Like that felt great. And I, and I, when I do that kind of like, what is it about that? A little gentle deconstruction. It's like, I was on my own. I was doing something like just for me. I was in the woods. Um, I was like connecting physically with stuff. And so you know, yeah, that's a process that I really like. And I have the similar experience with Facebook. I just went back on Facebook after a couple months because I felt like I missed something. I felt like I missed, for me, it's this sense of being part of this broader thing. Like there's people that I interact with on a daily basis. It's awesome. There's people I have that I connect with regularly. But like, there was this thing that I got that was like, there's all these people, like it's a little bit happening on this call. It's like people I know from college and people I know from high school and people I know from now. And, and so you can only really get that in one of those big platforms. And I missed that. And so for me, I feel like the, the priority is, you know, how do I get that thing without all the bad stuff that I got from Facebook? But um, I guess I just want to echo and say that I share, like there's something really good there. And um, that's one process I use for like clarifying what it is along with taking a break from it. Any follow-up, Mia? Well, it just sounds really embodied. Like, it just sounds like you have this like gut feeling or this, like, you just, you just know on some level. And then you like, you stop and you reflect on what was it about that? And oh, it was this, this, and this. And so... I don't know. I was just, I was just thinking about that. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so we'll have one more question. Uh, Rebecca, uh, if you can ask your question. Um, sure. So I'm finding myself wondering, um, and we're talking about essentially how to disconnect our, our, real selves, our IRL selves from our digital selves um, and, and to preserve a healthy relationship with our IRL selves. Um, and something that I'm kind of sensing and wondering about is, um, and, and something that you talked about, and I love this, was talking about humane technology and, and the issue being a lot of this technology being inhumane. Um, so say this technology were to become more humane, which would be, I guess, more, more warm, cuddly, more human compatible. Um, and with that, if the, the distinction between our, our IRL selves and our online selves were to kind of erode over time, um, is that necessarily a bad thing? Um, and it, 
actually is the question of whether or not it's a bad thing even relevant? Um, what if it's inevitable? Um, and we don't even really get to worry about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Is it just kind of what's coming? Yeah, and just to clarify that it being like the sort of collapsing and unifying of like who I am in, in the virtual world online and who I am in real life. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I definitely don't know. I don't know whether it's a good thing and I don't know whether it's inevitable. Yeah, this is kind of out of left field, but there's a, um, I've listened to this guy, Balaji Srinivasan, and he, he talks about sort of more divergence. His prediction is more divergence between in real life and online. He's got a whole background that's like, uh, you know, cancel culture will explode more and it'll be even more dangerous to be your authentic self if you believe you know, heterodox stuff. And so people will kind of, you know, dis disentangle their identities and become more you know, hidden even pseudonyms and stuff. I don't know, um, that seems plausible. Also seems plausible that this collapse happens. Um, I don't know if, if, if it's really, from my perspective, if it's really humane, if we really are interacting with tools that, you know, care for our vulnerabilities, support us in like carrying out our mission and like, and, and living, you know, right as we see it, um, seems good to me, I guess. And I do think there can be a kind of like disconnect or pain that comes from feeling like I'm one person out there and I'm one person here. So maybe that, maybe that'd be good. Any uh, quick follow up, Rebecca? Uh, no, I don't think so. Thank you. Cool. So uh, yeah, let's uh, close down here. Uh, Luke, uh, I know you'd like to uh, share something before um, we finish your close out today. Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna pull up my screen. So, as I said, you know, my project is, oops, yeah, doing this, helping people do this. Um, so if you're interested in continuing to get right with tech together with me, of course you can do it on your own with lots of resources, but ways to do it with me, I'm running these groups called Raft Groups, um, Reclaiming Agency from Technology. And so this is an eight week adventure, weekly meetings built around the declutter, a couple of weeks in the beginning to kind of settle in a declutter and then a little bit of reflection. Um, and it would be pretty great, I think. I did this, I've done this before and it's been pretty great energy. It's kind of like a mix between like the, the fellowship from the Lord of the Rings and like friends just chilling, hanging out and uh, like resistance fighters and like a meditation group. That's sort of the cluster of energy that I, <laughs> that I think of it as having. Um, and I also do individual coaching. So that's just focused more on just always on how you want to live and with tech just as a means for that or you know, an obstacle that dives a little deeper into the kind of underlying patterns, internal obstacles that you're struggling with generally that are showing up in tech, um, tech use. And for either of these, you can reach out to me by email um, at this email address and I'll just throw it in the chat here. And if you're interested, I would love to have you um, yeah, I'm just excited about doing this stuff. So thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, it's been fun sharing and hearing about what's going on with you guys. Is there a, like a website or something for the raft? Uh, if people are interested or a form, either they're watching the YouTube video or, or people in the here right now? Yeah, if you send me an email, I will send you a form. I'm working on a new website, so that should be up soon. But in the meantime, you just email me and I'll send you a form and you can sign up. Very cool. All right, so I'll make some closing announcements, but Luke, let's everyone give a round of applause for Luke for coming in, doing a presentation today. Uh, thank you so much, my friend. Uh, I love this topic. Um, and I think it's, uh, we really need it to, we really need a, a raft these days. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, uh, um, and I'll, I'll plug one event that's related. It might be a good follow-up. Uh, it's called the Implementation Gap. Um, Pur the Guru, uh, he's just like a blogger from India. Uh, he's pretty cool, um, and he's coming in uh, um, at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time on July 7th to talk about, you know, the implementation of the gap, why uh, uh, we don't always do what we know we should be doing. So uh, check that out, the stoa.ca. We've got a bunch of other events coming up. 
um yeah so luke everyone thanks so much for coming to the store today thank you